Reading is a responsive reading of Psalm 24. It can be found on page 791 in the back of your red hymnal, 791. You can take that hymnal out, go to 791, and then stand together as we prepare to come into worship. We'll respond together by, by reading the, the emboldened lines with one voice. I'll lead us in the, the finer print. Let us read this entire psalm as uh, we come together to worship our God and let us hear from his word. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. He will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God his Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord almighty. He is the King of glory. And if you would go back in your hymnal to number 198, we'll sing words inspired by this psalm. Lift up your heads, ye mighty gates. We'll sing verses 1 through 4 and 6. Verses 1 through 4 in the last, all but verse 5 of number 198. Lift up your heads.
Amen. Let us receive God's greeting and then confess our faith together with one voice. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of the heavens and the earth. Receive his greeting this morning. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. By the power of his Holy Spirit. Amen. If you would take your bulletin and let us confess these words together. We have sung of the King of glory, the one who lives and reigns forever. So let us say these words from our catechism as we think on the ascension of Christ. Christians, how does Christ's ascension to heaven benefit us? First, he pleads our cause in heaven in the presence of his Father. Second, we have our own flesh in heaven, a guarantee that Christ, our head, will take us, his members, to himself in heaven. Third, he sends his Spirit to us on earth as a further guarantee. By the Spirit's power, we make the goal of our lives not earthly things, but the things above, where Christ is, sitting at God's right hand. Amen. Please be seated. The Lord gave to his people clear commandment and instruction from of old. These words of the law ought to still ring in our ear. We read in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. When our Lord Jesus Christ was asked to summarize the law, he noted this commandment. He said, all of the law and the prophets hang on these, that you should love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The law of God is unchanging. It stands over us. It has been expressed to us in this way, also in the way of the Ten Commandments. And as we read this law as a mirror, uh, we are reminded that uh, we are sinful, that we are separated from God because of our sin, and we are to throw ourselves on the mercy of God because he is a God who delights to show mercy. Let us join in our hearts together, saying a prayer of confession, and uh, within this prayer we will leave some time for for silent confession that we may bring before God our own particular sins. Uh, Let us pray. God, you are the fountain of all good. You are righteous and holy and eternal. Father, we want to be those who would be mindful of your nature and your character and your work amongst your people as we gather for worship. We do not want to be flippant or cavalier about these things. We think upon your law and all that you have commanded us to do. We know that that we have not loved you with all of our heart. We know that we have put other gods before you, that we have crafted idols in our own hearts, that we have taken your name in vain, that we have not set aside time for you or honored your holy day that you give to us. We know that we have disregarded the authorities that you have placed over us. Father, we know that we have been filled with anger and malice toward our neighbors. We know that we have been filled with lust and with sensual pleasure. Father, we know that we have taken what is not rightfully ours, that we have not loved the truth. And we know that we have let our hearts be filled with the desire that we would have that which belongs to others, that you have been pleased to give them. Father, in this we recognize that there is no health in us. So destroy in us every lofty thought. 
break our pride to pieces, scatter it to the winds, destroy in us every shred of self-righteousness, that we would have lowliness of spirit and a humility of heart. Father, that we would despise our sin, and through that, that we would look to Christ. In these moments, Father, we bring before you uh, that which we are mindful of, which we know has offended you recently in our lives. Father, empower us by your Spirit to be those that would linger long at the cross of Jesus Christ, that we would simultaneously see our sin, that we would see his work and his righteousness and his blood, which covers our transgressions and all of our wanderings. So break us and bind us up. Bind up the brokenhearted, that you, Father, can comfort us as your children, that The Christ may come with healing in his touch, that the Holy Spirit may descend in sanctifying grace. Have mercy, O Lord. Have mercy upon us for your Son, Jesus Christ, uh, for his sake and in his name we pray. Amen. The Gospel of John gives us these wonderful words, reminding us of the coming of our Lord, born was born in humble estate, lived a life for us. John says this, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. We give thanks to the Lord for his gospel, and for his mercy that he sheds abroad in our hearts. Let's uh, remain seated and sing a a song of thanksgiving, uh, remembering what we celebrate this time of the year, uh, around Christmas time. If you go to page uh, 219, hymn number 219 in your red hymnals, all praise to the eternal Lord. Let's sing uh, verses 1 through through 3 and then verse 5, verses 1 through 3, and then verse 5, all but verse 4 of all praise to the eternal Lord.
Our hope is found in Christ alone. Let's stand together and sing that. Found on page 10 in your white songbooks, page 10. Let's stand together and sing in Christ alone. Isaiah chapter Isaiah chapter 43, beginning in verse 25, we'll read through chapter 44, verse 6. It'll be on page 1128 if you're using the Pew Bible, as we gather around the word of the Lord this morning. Before we do so, 
knowing that uh, this is God's inerrant and infallible word given to us uh, for our good, let us go to God in prayer, asking him to speak through this word. Father, in these moments, as we look to your word as the source of eternal truth, we pray that you would open our ears and our minds, that you would soften our hearts to receive this word, that you would enliven our souls to, to see and to know the glorious realities that you have given to us through your Son and in your covenant grace. Father, we ask that your servant in these moments would speak uh, your truth, that you would forgive him of sin. Father, that what is declared today might serve to honor you and you alone. We pray and we ask all these things in faith, knowing that you can do abundantly beyond all we ask or think. In Christ's name, amen. Isaiah 43, verse 25, God's holy word. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Review the past for me. Let us argue the matter together. State the case of your innocence. Your first father sinned. Your spokesman rebelled against me. So I will disgrace the dignitaries of your temple, and I will consign Jacob to destruction and Israel to scorn. But now listen, O Jacob, my servant, Israel whom I have chosen. This is what the Lord says. He who made you, who formed you in the womb, and who will help you. Do not be afraid, O Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They will spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees by flowing streams. One will say, I belong to the Lord. Another will call himself by the name of Jacob. Still another will write on his hand, the Lord's, and will take the name Israel. This is what the Lord says, Israel's king and redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. The grass withers, the flower fades, the word of our Lord endures forever. As we search the scriptures, it's, it's clear we see in many different ways, in many different places, the wonderful plan of God uh, to redeem his people out of their sin. And uh, we see the, the unified plan of God, his redemption. We think of it as we see it in, in the Gospels, as we've studied the Gospel of Luke, and we have seen again and again in the unfolding of the life of Jesus Christ that he has come to do the Father's will, and he is not forced by any human hands to, to do anything, he willingly lays his life down, for this was uh, begotten in the, man, in the mind of God before all ages. We've seen this as we've looked at uh, the doctrines of grace this past fall, and uh, we've seen the plan of God for the ages, that from eternity past, all of history has been shaped by a, uh, his decree, and his decree still shapes history, so that God might bring his people into communion with him so that they might serve him in, in gladness and in joy. We see this in the offices of prophet and priest and king, how it all serves to remind us that we cannot create our own salvation, but we needed one who would come as prophet and priest and king for us. We see it in all of the aspects of the Christ story that we celebrate around December 25th. And we must understand that what we are celebrating is, is a piece of that, God's plan of redemption. We must see the one who was born in a manger, who was born in humble estate, as the one who is destined to ascend the hill of the Lord with clean hands and a pure heart, the one who is the king of glory, as we read in Psalm 24 this morning. We hear, we remember this sovereign grace 
of God. And it reminds us, it, it moves us to worship and to serve our God who is our king and our redeemer, the first and the last. This passage in the book of Isaiah uh, does all of these things. It it highlights many of these things, the the covenant of grace, the the electing love of God who has chosen his people and and will not fail in redeeming them, The, the, the communion bond into which he brings his people. He creates life and and makes life spring up by the power of the Spirit that he he spreads abroad throughout his people. And it does so uh, in the context of the idea of the servant of the Lord. God is speaking to his people here in Isaiah 43 and 44 with this idea of the servant of the Lord. And as we dig into that concept in Scripture, we see it leading us to the one who is the true servant of the Lord what we call the the true Israel, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Redeemer. This is what we are celebrating at Christmas. So let us consider these things uh, together. The context of our our passage is one of tension. There's this this growing tension around this time, uh, this part of Isaiah. We certainly know that God remembers his people and he remembers his promise. We see at the beginning of chapter 43... Thus says the Lord, he says to Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. God giving these promises of comfort to his people. But one of the reasons that they need comfort is that God has been very clear with them about naming their rebellion and their sinfulness. Just before chapter 43 and 42, God has pointed out that Israel turned their backs upon God, that they created idols of wood and stone and metal. And so in chapter 42, God compares his people, whom he calls my servant, to someone who is deaf and blind, someone grasping around in the darkness. Israel was like a a deaf and a blind person, not knowing uh, what they were grabbing onto, how it affected their life with God, how it affected their worship, grasping around not knowing where they reached or onto what uh, they were grasping. But the Lord says, fear not, fear not. I have chosen you. I have redeemed you. I am your God. I am your redeemer. So the intermixing of these two themes, the, the sovereign grace and the love of God, the promise to redeem, but then this growing tension of their sinfulness and their idolatry, Uh, The the intermixing of these two themes highlights something for us. A very clear uh, message of scripture that we see from beginning to end. Very clear but essential to understand is that God alone saves by his sovereign grace. God alone saves by his sovereign grace. That is what uh, this part of Isaiah, at least partly, is highlighting for us. And our passage does a wonderful job of driving this home for us, bringing attention to God and then exalting his name as it names his salvation. The first verse in our passage, I, even I, am he. Notice the repetition of the the first person pronouns. I, I am he. God says this, he speaks this way even earlier in chapter 43. He says, I, even I am the Lord. Besides me, there is no Savior. God is bringing attention to himself. In a sense, you could say he's furnishing his people with a worldview of being God-centered. He wants them to be thinking about him. He wants them to have him on the forefront of their minds. And that's what he is doing as he declares this word, bringing attention onto himself. It is not selfish, it is not sinful for God to do this. Because God knows that only he can give his people exactly what they need. When human beings act this way, it is, it is egomaniacal, it is selfish, it is sinful. But God can always say to his creature, look to me, come to me. Trust in me. And so God is magnifying his name and he's doing it in the context of forgiveness. I, I am the one who blots out your transgressions, who forgives your sins and who remembers them no more. He also tells us in this first verse, 
why he does this. Why does God forgive sin? Why does he redeem? Well, there are at least two aspects that we should remember when we think of God forgiving and redeeming his people for his own sake. He does it because he delights in being a God of forgiveness, and he does it for his own glory. First, he is a God who delights in forgiving sin. One of the greatest uh, passages in Scripture that brings this to our minds is Micah chapter 7. Who is a God like you, it says, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. This is a God who delights in forgiveness, who delights in wiping away and blotting out sins and transgressions. Not only does he do it for his own pleasure, but he does it for the sake of his own glory. Isaiah chapter 48, and just in a couple chapters ahead, the Lord points this out through the prophet. He says, for my name's sake, I defer my anger. In other words, I don't take out and exercise all my wrath on your sin. For the sake of my praise, I restrain it. For my own sake, for my own sake, I do it. My glory I will not give to another. God is in the business of glorifying his name in the salvation of sinners. That he glorifies himself not only as he shows the wonder of his grace in forgiving the sins of his people, but also... And that he is creating for himself a people who will worship him in spirit and in truth because of the things that he has done. A people who are, who are mindful of living for him and glorifying his name for the forgiveness that he sheds abroad. Psalm 23, very famous passage. It says, he leads me in paths of righteousness. Why? For his name's sake. He makes me to obey him. And to know his word. And to desire to magnify him for his name's sake. So here in Isaiah, even from the very beginning, we see this centrality of God's work in redemption. It is his work and it is not ours. This is centrally what we're remembering at Christmas. That the work of redemption is God's work and it is not ours. This is a plan that could not have been conceived in the mind of man. And certainly could not have been executed through the mind and the power of man. These are good tidings of great joy. Good tidings of great joy. But in order for them to be good tidings of great joy, we also need to be mindful of human sinfulness. And that's exactly what God does through the prophet in this passage in Isaiah 43 and 44. These good tidings must be seen in the light of sin. When God's grace is seen in the light of sin it allows us to appreciate it more, to praise God all the more for it. As it operates in this passage, we see that it serves to throw off or cause us to throw off all of our self-confidence, all of the vain trust that we have in ourselves, all of the the self-righteousness that we would construct in our own minds. So God says, "I, I remember your sins no more. Wonderful promise. But then at the beginning of verse 26, God repeats that verb to remember to use it in a completely different way. We we might say the beginning of verse 26, you could translate it by saying, cause me to remember the past. God is saying, "Let's, let's remember all of the things. Where it says, review the past for me. Really, you could say, cause me to remember all of the things that have come to pass. So God is is saying this in an ironic way. It's an ironic way of saying, "Let's, let's think about all of the things that you have done. Let's, let's state the case plainly. And what the Lord is doing here is he's, he's, talking, he's speaking to his people. And, and he wants to assert his right to claim the glory of saving them. He wants to make sure that they understand, this is that from which I have saved you. This is how I saved you out of your sinfulness and caused you to be forgiven. God has not missed anything. God knows all of the things that have happened, but this invitation serves as a reminder to his people to throw off all confidence in themselves, to swear off all self-righteousness and all boasting. We would say that God is confronting this flaw within all of us, this flaw within all of us that we have. To We want to add to our standing before God. We desperately want to 
play a part or a role in our salvation. We want to construct some kind of righteousness in and of ourselves that God would see. Of course, in the individual context, we know as we search our hearts, as we look inward, that this is vain. But God says perhaps there could be a representative from among you. Maybe there's someone you could bring forward that would impress me in terms of their righteousness. Bring forth your heroes. So God says, well, but your first father, your first father sinned. We don't know uh, specifically to whom this refers. It could refer to Abraham, a man of faith who was called out of his land. He left his family to go where the Lord told him to go. Man of faith, the father of the faithful. But certainly we would say that Abraham had his own sins, his own shortcomings. Genesis chapter 20, there's a Gentile king who says to Abraham, you have done a wicked thing when Abraham presents Sarah as his sister. He says, here is my sister, take her for your wife in order that Abraham might be safe. Faithful man, but a flawed man. First father could refer to Jacob, the the fount of all 12 tribes. But Jacob, the name itself means deceiver or it means overreacher and all throughout the life of Jacob we see him a scheming in order to achieve what he wants a life riddled with shortcomings and bad judgments perhaps the first father we could reach further back we could go to Adam but there of course would probably even be even worse than the first two Adam was created in true knowledge and righteousness and holiness he lost that communion and that fellowship with God But perhaps many hands would make light work. So rather than just one hero, maybe you could uh, combine a bunch of people. So the Lord brings up these spokesmen. When the Lord says, your spokesmen have failed as well, to whom is he referring? He's referring to Israel's prophets and priests and kings. Among these three groups, we certainly have some good options. Those uh, men who indeed showed some righteousness in their lives. Maybe perhaps like David. But again, the same problem as we see again and again. They all have points at which they fail. Where they experience the realities of indwelling and entangling sin. As you go to scripture and as you see from beginning to end, you are hit with this reality that you need to view all things through the lens of the presence of sin. Sin is a, is a profound mystery. As we look at it in scripture. It's a profound mystery. But it is an ever present reality. It's an ever present reality. I was struck uh, this past week. There was a really interesting article. That I found in a newspaper. And the the author was puzzled. Was puzzled in a sense. Because he uh, had studied. Gone to some studies, studies recently. And he found that a large portion of the earth's population shows characteristics from what he calls the dark triad. The dark triad of narcissism, which is an excessive focus on oneself. Machiavellianism, big word, that means manipulating others for one's gain. Or, or, and psychopathy, an overall disregard for others. This author was puzzled because he, from his worldview and the way that, that he thinks the world should be going, he says, okay, well... This is a problem because the, the, uh, the theory of evolution says that these kinds of harmful characteristics should be uh, rid uh, from the, the human race. They should be gone because you would think that according to the theory of evolution that the people who display these kinds of characteristics would not be able to mate and reproduce and so we would see all of these things fall away. So why is it that we keep seeing these characteristics pop up in such a large swath of the population? One of my favorite quotes from a Puritan says this, As long as there are spots on the moon, it is vain to expect anything spotless under it. As long as there are spots on the moon, it is vain to expect anything spotless under it. Sin is a profound mystery, but it's an ever present reality the best of men are still men every generation upon this earth as long as God allows this world to endure will be made in the image of God but fallen and entangled in their sinfulness God reminds his people that if they want to make a case for their merit if they want to bring up the past it will come to nothing 
Certainly, I think if you look into your own heart, this is not something you would want to do uh, before the Lord. We do not want to revisit our past, but the Lord provokes these thoughts in the minds of his people so that they might rid themselves of self-righteousness. God alone is our salvation. A broken and a humble and a contrite heart he will not despise. I must humble myself before God day by day. We all must humble ourselves before God. We will find strength in weakness for when we are weak, then we are strong. In the remaining uh, moments this morning, let us turn our attention to chapter 44 where we see this theme of the servant of the Lord. When we are weak, then we are strong because we are strong when we stand in God's servant, the true servant of the Lord. As we trace this idea in chapter 44, we will see that it points us to Christ as the true servant of the Lord, the true Israel. The word servant is one of the most important Old Testament words for how we understand the Messiah, the one who was sent, born in Bethlehem to be the Savior of the world. It's one of the most important words because it highlights exactly what both Adam and Israel failed to do. The the role or the mission of Israel as the people of God was to respond to God in faith and obedience in this covenant where God called them to himself. And that they would respond by saying, here I am, so that they might show the world what it meant to be God's creatures. Israel was to, in a sense, show the world the the, the, the true meaning of what it meant to be human beings, to be the creatures of God, to show God that we were, uh, to show the world that we were made for fellowship with God. We were made to be joined to him in a loving Bond. See, in that sense, Israel was to show the world that all people are made for the glories and the bliss of heaven that only the people of God will enjoy in eternity. God had chosen them to be his servants. You see that in, in a singular, not, not a plural, not servants, but often, especially in Isaiah, he calls them his servants. They were to say, here I am, Lord, to live according to your will and your sovereignty and your law. Of course, this is what we don't see in the history of Israel. And the history of Israel reflects more accurately the history of Adam. You go back to the Garden of Eden. After Adam has fallen, after he has, after he has sinned, the Lord says, Adam, where are you? Adam is fleeing the presence of God. He is running away. He's not standing and saying, here I am, Lord. He is running away and fleeing God's presence. This is what Israel did. Rather than uh, delighting In communion with God, they would often flee the presence of God. They said to Moses, you be the one who goes between. You be the one who speaks with the Lord, but we cannot stand to be in his presence. This is the creature breaking the covenant made by their creator. And it highlights for us this extremely important point that brings us to Christ. And it's this. To be a true covenant servant. One must respond in God's call with, here I am, Lord, with perfect and absolute, perpetual obedience. And this is where we see the the gospel of Christ, the story of Christmas, shine through in this passage. Think about the seeming contradiction that we have up to this point. God has said, I'm the one who blots out your transgressions. But then he brings up the past. He says, let's revisit it together. State the case of your innocence. But then at the beginning of of chapter 44, God returns once again to his covenant love and forgiveness. He says, I have chosen you. I have formed you in the womb. I will help you. And then he says, do not be afraid. But their sinfulness would cause them, you would think, to fear God, to be afraid. So we see that God will uphold his covenant. He will remember his promise. But we also see that God's justice will endure. He will not thwart his justice, but he will not forget his covenant. And how we see this coalesce, how we see this answer come to us in Scripture is as you, especially in the book of Isaiah, as you trace this idea of the servant of the Lord, you see more and more as you go further and further in the book of Isaiah that it whittles down to talk not about the nation collectively, not about all of the people uh, of Israel, but it whittles down more and more until it's the, the enduring vision of an individual, one who would come as the true servant of the Lord. One who would come and say, here I am, Lord, to do your will, 
to do that which is pleasing to you. One of the crowning moments of this in the book of Isaiah is, of course, Isaiah 53, where the suffering servant is called the servant of the Lord, the one who would come, who would bear the sins of God's people. We read in Isaiah 53, the servant of the Lord has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. My servant will make many to be accounted righteous, and he will bear their iniquities. But here you see the servant of the Lord, the righteous one, makes sinners to be accounted righteous as he bears their sin. And that way we see that Christ is the true Israel. He's the true Israel, the one to whom the entire history of Israel is leading. Not only do the offices of prophet, priest, and king lead us to the true prophet and priest and king, but the call upon the nation as a whole to be true covenant partners with God, to respond faithfully with here I am, shows us that it was only Christ who could be that faithful covenant partner who could ascend the hill with clean hands and a pure heart. But here's what it means for us to know God in a covenant of grace, not a covenant of works, but a covenant of grace. The Lord came, was born in a manger, lived his life, perfect life, goes to the cross, is raised up, goes to heaven. In Hebrews chapter 2, have this wonderful glimpse of the Lord ascending, and he says, he stands before the Father, and he says, here I am, and the children God has given to me. This is the wonder the glory of the gospel, that Christ lived as this faithful covenant servant. And then he ascends into heaven to stand before the Father and says, here I am, not only myself, but all those whom I represent, that we would stand alive in this risen Christ, in this faithful covenant partner. And that is why we have this promise all throughout scripture, do not be afraid, do not be afraid, do not be afraid. Because the reality is, brothers and sisters, with our sin, we should be afraid. We should be very afraid. But God can say, do not fear. Because he has forgiven us as we stand in his son, the servant of the Lord. The apostle John experienced this. Revelation chapter 1, he has an experience that's very similar to that of the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 6, he sees the risen and exalted Christ and he hits the floor. Because he knows that he is not worthy. He says that this, he has this vision of Christ as he is caught up to heaven. He says his eyes were like a flame of fire. In his right hand he had seven stars. When I saw him I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. So we think about... Christ being our king, our king of glory, the power that he has been given, the name that he has been given, the life that he enjoys as the risen and exalted one. This does not create for us a sense of fear, but a sense of comfort to those who look to this one as their mediator, as their savior. The more powerful he is, the more powerful he is for his people. We can say that he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And that's wonderful because we are the ones who are seated with him in heavenly places. We are the ones who stand alive in the risen Christ. That he represents us before the Father. That he appears before the Father for sin and for sinners. That is what he is doing in his work. This is the work of the only begotten son, the one who lived in thanksgiving and devotion. He says, I am the first and the last in Revelation chapter 1, which is the exact thing that God says in the book of Isaiah, showing to us that this Christ is the God-man who has all power and all authority and exercises it for his people. Behold the love and the grace and the mercy of God. This one had to come humbly in the low condition laid in a manger. He had no form that we should look upon him. His glory that the Apostle John sees later on was veiled while he walked this earth. But when his testing is complete, he raises, he is raised to heaven and he leads captivity itself captive. And through death, he conquers death. This is the life-giving grace of God. And this is why at the end, towards the end of our passage this morning, The prophet Isaiah has this vision of life 
springing forth. Life springs forth from the grace of God for he is pleased, for he is on this mission to create worshipers of him who worship him in spirit and in truth. He pours water on the dry ground. He causes this lush green life to rise up by the flowing streams, the flowing streams of grace as his spirit is poured out upon his people. Verse 5 of Isaiah 44, one will say, I belong to the Lord. One will take the name of Jacob. Another will write, I belong to the Lord. In other words, by all modes of expression, the people of God will take delight and take joy in belonging to this God who blots out their sins, even though he does not ignore the fact of their sinfulness. He atones for it by giving one who would be a servant of the Lord, who would come to this earth as the God-man. Just as the Magi fell down before the living Christ, so all who have been made clean and pure by the work of the righteous servant will do so. He has clean hands and a pure heart. He gives to us clean hands and a pure heart, even though we are defiled and have divided hearts. Just as the angels glorify the newborn king, so the people made alive in this servant of the Lord, praise him who lives and reigns in heaven, who seats us with him in heaven. We're called to set our minds on the life that he gives to us there, to take great joy in being found in the living Christ, to take great joy in being made to worship and serve and love your God. So brothers and sisters, do what you were created to do, to enjoy eternal union and communion with this God, in the fellowship of his people. Glorify and worship and serve your king. Let your spiritual life be like that language that we see of life propping up everywhere. Serve your king, the righteous servant, the first and the last, our prophet and our priest and our king, the king of glory, the true Israel. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for your word and your truth. Lift our eyes and our hearts to heaven where we see Christ exalted and risen. May we take great joy, unending joy, in being found in him, seated in heavenly places, given that never-ending life of the one who stands before the Father, says, here I am, and the children God has given me. We pray in his name. Amen. We'll stand together and sing number 339. Hark the herald angels sing. We'll sing all three verses and stand together. 339 in our blue hymnal.
wonderful day in Christ. Receive the benediction of our God. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen.